My name's Cherie, and um, this is a pretty casual um, session. If you have questions or you can add comments or stories, we don't know all the answers. We just are going to tell you some of the things we do. Um, usually I don't need a microphone. It's so weird to have to hold one. Even in an auditorium at a big high school, I don't use one. But uh, my experience in education is this. I started at, at teaching ninth grade in history and geography. And so I was, and then became an administrator at the same school. So I was at South Cash, which was an 8 9 center for um, what, 11, 12, 13, 14 years. Then I went to Mountain Crest High School for eight. Um, that's where I became an alcoholic. And um, no, I really am not. I just threaten people. Um, it's just so much work, but so rewarding. I mean, kids are awesome. And then I was given the opportunity, actually I took the opportunity, I talked to the superintendent because I had a son who'd started playing sports and I was at everyone's sporting events but my own kids. And so I said, hey, I either have to stop buying shoes or I've got to get out of Mountain Crest because I need to be able to watch my own child. And um, the, the soup in, said, hey, what do you think about Cash High? And um, I'm so excited to be there. It's awesome. And... Um, there's so many people now walking in I should be thanking because of our success at Cash High, but what it amounts to is we take the students at the four high schools who are deficient in credit. And it's interesting because when I got there, the reputation kind of has this druggy, loser crowd reputation, but the reality is it's not that at all. Um, as you can tell already, I'm a calm individual and would put up with a lot. <laughs> Ed, I'd appreciate it if you'd play along. And, um, the, the, la the stupidity is limited. It's not a drug culture. It's a great pa place to learn. When I got there, there were probably 70, 80 students. Um, we have about 120 that we serve. Um, Mountain Crest High School this year graduated 256. We graduated 110. Um, so good things happen at Cash High. However, our focus today is not just cash high, but just high schools in general and how we help kids be resilient. Just some ideas that we've come up with that we're doing. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, my better half. This is a, the, kind of the founder of Cash High School, and Ron's very humble. He's an English teacher there, but really the school should be called Ron Stott. Um, <laughs> he can reach kids and teach resilience like no one you will ever meet. And um, I'll let him tell a little bit about himself. Who also doesn't need a mic. Yeah. No, not at all. So, yeah, holding this is a little strange. Um, first of all, if we could get all of you to move in so we have... No, I joke. I'm choking. <laughs> Actually, if each one of you will get your own row, <laughs> that will make us feel better. Okay? Um, so I've been a Cash High for 28 years. Uh, cash High's been alive for 28 years. Uh, I didn't know what I was... I was going to say getting into, but the opportunities that were uh, going to come through the next two or three decades when I uh, was student teaching, I was a baseball coach out at Mountain Crest. I was doing my student teaching with the intentions of getting a job there the next year. And um, during the baseball banquet, the uh, superintendent was sitting next to the principal at the time at Mountain Crest. And they kept pointing at me and talking, and I knew something bad was going to happen. Like I kept checking, you know, make sure everything was okay and, you know, that type of thing. I knew I was in trouble because when people point at me, I'm in trouble. Um, and uh, the uh, principal introduced me to the superintendent, and he explained that they were going to start a new school this next year, an alternative school that the district had never had. And he said he thought I would fit in there fine, that that would be a good thing for me. Um, and I said, sure, absolutely. No one had offered me a job, and I said, absolutely. That was my job interview. That was my uh, application. That was my whole thing. That was it right then. And um, I, ca I called the superintendent every Monday asking him if we had a school yet because he had this great idea, but there was nothing there. We didn't have a building. We didn't have a principal. We didn't have anything. Um, and every Monday I would call, and he'd say, no, but we're working on it. We're getting there. Have faith, we're working on it. And finally one Monday he said, um, yeah, I've got you a principal. And almost before I could hang up, I was in my car heading to the island and um, introducing myself to the principal who probably thought I was a stalker or some, you know, somebody who had escaped. And so uh, we went from there. We uh, spent 27 years in a warehouse 
basically a converted warehouse uh, that leaked in multiple places. Um, every time it would rain, we would readjust our trash cans to catch all the rain that came through the roof. Um, and that was okay. That was all right because it wasn't about the building. It was about the kids. This year, we're in a, a brand new building. It actually looks like a school. It actually is a school. Well, I take that back because the old building was a school as well. Uh, the new building is phenomenal. Um, it's got a gym. Uh, we had a ribbon cutting here just this past fall. Um, it's phenomenal. It's, it's an amazing thing for the kids. Uh, as teachers, I'm not sure we notice as much, but the kids now have something that reflects their worth, and um, it's pretty amazing. Um, as Cherie mentioned, and, and I'm glad she's come out of her shell because she's very, very timid and quiet. Um, she's going to explain some of the things that we do at uh, Cash High, and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that we do in the classrooms, and um, hopefully some of this stuff will, will um, fill in some gaps that you may have. If you have any questions, I know Sheree already said this, but if you have any questions, it would work a whole lot better if you just asked them right now so that we don't have to try to remember at the end. Um, I rarely remember my name by the end of the hour. Um, so if you'll do that, it'll work out a whole lot better. Okay, why don't you read your poem? Okay. Just kind of jump starts because it's kind of the essence of any high school. Cash High is unique to us, but any, any adult high school has been and it's how many of you are teachers? I'm just curious, our audience. And administrators, I know there's some. Pain in the butts. Yeah. <laughs> um, social workers, what are some of your other, tell me what the, what the rest of you do. What are you guys? I work for family first. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. That family place is awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That is a great addition to us here in the valley. What do you do? I'm a retired psychologist from Caldwell Fair. Thank you. Gosh, would you like to come do it with us? <laughs> oh, we would love you. Yeah, thank you. I work with the at risk kids in the elementary school. Okay, here in the valley in Logan District or down in Bear River. In Bear River? Okay. He's a tech guy, huh? Yeah, you. So I, uh, I'm from Rich County. I, I teach. I'm the assistant principal at the middle school in elementary in Lake Townsend. Okay. So you're not <laughs> <laughs> you know, you oh, oh, and you brought an example right. with the baby. Us. Okay, that was cool. <laughs> Family place. Nice. Anyway, this poem kind of sums up what we do every day, so Ron will read that in a minute. And this is a nice reminder. You know, at Cash High, we have a lot of kids that struggle. Well, almost all the kids struggle. Um, and it's a daily reminder, and that's good, and that's fine, and we understand that. But every once in a while, we kind of get a little frustrated with what's going on. And uh, I keep a copy of this real close to my desk so it reminds me. And if I start to get emotional, it's because I'm allergic to microphones. Because <laughs> I ain't got a pencil by Joshua T. Dickerson. I woke myself up because we ain't got an alarm clock. Dug in the dirty clothes basket because ain't nobody washed my uniform. Brushed my hair and teeth in the dark because the lights ain't on. Even got my baby sister ready, because mama wasn't home. Got us both to school on time to eat us a good breakfast. Then when I got to class, the teacher fussed at me, because I ain't got a pencil. Look what this kid's doing in his life to try to make things right. And we come down on him because he didn't have a pencil. Billy, seriously, again? I gotta give you a pencil again? Really, look what he just did. Look at, look at how he stepped up and made himself and his family and his little sister um, in a position where they can do good things during the day and we're worried because they didn't have a pencil. Uh, yeah, I keep this right by my desk because I don't want ever, ever get on a kid for not having a pencil or a piece of paper when he's trying to create himself a life or overcome some of the aces that are flooding around him all the time um, and try to make his life work. So um, that's kind of where we come from at Cash High. This is where we start. Thanks. Um, a few things that we have learned over time that works. 
like some of the data that Dr. Red gave, um, I keep referring to him as Ed because I consider him a friend, but that's probably not professionally correct. Sorry. I, I know he would respond to jerk as well, but um, Ed, we are lucky to have a great connection with Dr. Red, and he has trained our faculty for two years now on trauma-informed care. And so the amazing thing about being a student at Cash High is you don't ex just experience Ron, who seems like a crazy hippie, and usually he looks really good today. He never looks like that at school. And um, all the teachers have that same touch, and they all, it's always about the kid. It's never about English. Um, I sat in numerous meetings in previous occupations I had where English was the focus. And the teacher was very concerned because, well, they're not learning responsibility. And English really matters. And then what are you going to do? And as an administrator, it's kind of hard because the kid's shriveled up, the parent doesn't even register, and we're yelling at them about English. And um, the refreshing thing about um, Cash High was just, it wasn't just a, overwhelming thing I had to create as an administrator. It was already there. It was a feeling that the student always comes first. And so really the content at Cash High is students. And you know, the icing is just the English and a little bit of math. And um, however, because we focus on them first, the success is pretty high. Um, Dr. Red came this past year and spent time with the kids building soapbox cars. And um, as you can see, he's not a busy guy and um, he does need to spend it at Cash High building cars. And so he came literally every day for, I don't know, three weeks. Spent Saturday on spring break. I'm in Vegas sitting in the sun and I get a call. How can Dr. Red get in the building? Um, we're just going to give him a key. We think it'd be easier. Um, but he built these cars and then they went and raced him. And talk about satisfaction. They competed against with kids from Utah State. There was no other high schools involved. I think Intec had a car, but it didn't ever run. And, well, I care because I'm competitive, and <laughs> I'm getting therapy if that makes you feel better. I recognize I've got a problem. Um, but anyway, the kids competed, and, and our kids took about middle of the pack, but they felt so successful and cool about it, and the cars sit there in the parking lot, and I have to tell them at lunch, you can't race your car. Okay, so if you'd take those home. Anyway... Um, <laughs> Other things we do, we have a 92% graduation rate, which for an alternative high school is unheard of. And um, I think it's because of the trauma-informed care. I would attribute that to our knowledge um, and just constant focus on things like, I ain't got a pencil. Don't lose sight of what really matters in the classroom, whether you're at a high school or middle school. What really matters is that your clientele and those students and and who they are and when they've, where they've been. And Ron said to me, um, the hardest day at school for me is always the first day. And I thought, well, it is for everyone. But, yeah. And he said, no, no, it's because I don't know the kids. And I thought, what? And I'll let him address that for a minute. Um, I don't know if I should admit this, because there's people here who probably can adjust my job title. Um, <laughs> But I make this confession to my kids quite often. I actually have a board off the side of my room, and I, I, it's a place, it's called the Honor Board, and it's a place where I can put their names when they do good things. And I actually keep track of their attendance up there so they can you know, follow along and that type of thing. But up above each of the, the columns is the class that I'm teaching, and I tell the kids that I put that up there so I can remember what I'm supposed to teach you this hour because I'd rather just talk about life. Um, life always comes first in my room. And I promise I slip some English in once in a while, or journalism, or you know whatever we're teaching. But um, life always comes first. Uh, these kids, and, and I, I always see these kids because I, it's the only place I've ever taught. Uh, I coach baseball at Logan High, so I, I get to see different types of kids, I guess. But um, uh, I'm not with them all day long, and um, I just know that life is more important. Nothing else seems to fit in the hierarchy of things unless their lives are working okay. That should be obvious to everybody. Um, I don't remember exactly the setting, but I had somebody tell me, and this was even before I became a teacher, um, that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I believe that completely in every setting, but especially at Cash High. Um, the English is important, and it has its place. Um, let me just share this with you, and I hadn't planned on doing this, but let me just share this with you. I, I, I talk about diplomas a lot 
in my classroom. At the end of every term, I ask the kids um, how well they did in their classes, and I don't want answers. I, I just want them to think about this. And the criteria I want them to use is, did you give your best effort? So whatever grade you got, uh, my parents were real big on I had to have an A or a B, which forced me to have other people do my work in some classes so I can get an A or a B and be able to leave the house occasionally. Um, and, I, and I tell the kids that um, if you don't know what your grades are right now, we're missing something. Something's not right, okay? And then first, I want them to know what their grades are. And second, I want to know if the, that's the best that they could do. And if a C-plus is the best that they can do, then they need to pat themselves on the back. Our kids have a real hard time of patting themselves on the back. If they get a, an F notice or Cherie asks them to stay after school to work on something or we have to pull them out of one class to work on something else, they seem to handle the failures as a matter of fact. Like, that's what I always do. It's expected. Yeah, yeah I, always, I always screw up. Um, but I've noticed that our kids don't handle successes very well, and that's why I started a board in my room that, you know, I can, I, this is, these are the kids who are doing exceptionally well, these are my students of the week, these are, you know, whatever kind of thing. Because the kids don't, don't do that. So, one, do you know what your grades are, and two, is it as good as you can get? Because as good as you can get, as redundant as this may sound, is as good as you can get. And that's what you need to do in every facet of life. Everything in my room, well, everything we do, I, I don't know what the other teachers do, okay? And so I always say everything that happens in my room. That's not to, to isolate me and say I'm doing it right and it all works here and I don't know what those other guys are pulling off. That's not what it's all about. Um, I just, you know, that's all I'm concerned about is what's going on in front of me. And um, kids need to understand the processes that it takes. Gary talked about that several times, and I think he actually used the word process once. But what he did with those changes in his life were processes. We don't always have control over the end result, but we always have control over the process. There's a big sign, and, and Sri said, I look good, which is obviously a lie. But um, I meant compared. Yeah, compared to, uh, forget it. Um, I, every day to school, I wear um, tie-dye shirt, a pair of uh, uh, shorts. Even in the middle of winter, and I wear flip flops, and the flip flops go under my desk, and we go barefoot all day. So that's just who I am. And so this is really feels uncomfortable. The shoes will come off first when I get out of here. Um, so one of the kids 15, 20 years ago made me a big, it's a sheet, tie dyed sheet, and it's in, the, in my room where everybody can see it. It says, Life is always about the process. Because that's what we're working on is the process. Um, these kids haven't had good pasts, and some of them are still fighting to make today a, a positive reality, but we can always, always, always focus on the process. So when I ask the kids, what are your grades? It's not about the grades. Are they the best that you can do? It's not about that specifically. It's about what are the processes that, are, that you're using to get to these points? So we're always talking about life. Everything, 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 everything can be connected with life. If it isn't, we don't use it. Um, the novels I use, the, the worksheets, the things that we do. It's not about the worksheets, guys. It's not about the worksheet. This worksheet on grammar is not going to change your life, I promise. But how much you care about it and the effort you put into it and that you're worth something to make this the best you can be, that's worth a ton. That's everything, guys. That's everything. Okay, And that's how we handle every process because we need to make sure that they're okay and that they'll accept their successes and they'll realize their successes. And the bottom line is always, and I probably say this a thousand times during the school year, is, and if I get to something and I'm kind of seeing some blank faces out there like, I'm not sure what you're trying to get across to us, the bottom line is always, at the end, is you're worth it. This is why we're trying to make things better. This is trying to, why we're trying to get our diploma. This is why we're trying to whatever, 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 is that you're worth it. One more note about a diploma and then I'm sure he's got some magic tricks she wants to show you. No, <laughs> she's going, okay, great. Um, we talk about diplomas a lot in, in class because that's what they're trying to get at Cash High is a diploma. And I ask kids why they want that. And they say, well, so I can get a better job or I can, you know, I can get some interviews at better places. And I said, okay, well, that's all cool. But your diploma doesn't guarantee you a thing. It's just a piece of paper. It's a really cool piece of paper, and we're going to put it in this really nice little folder type thing you can put on your mantle, and it's going to be really nice to look at. But it doesn't mean a thing. 
there's only two or three words on that diploma that mean anything at all. They give any kind of worth at all. And some of the kids have heard this before, so they'll raise their hand. And they'll say, that's my name. So Ron Stott, if we make it official and put your middle name, whatever, that name in bold letters right in the middle of the diploma is really the only thing on that piece of paper that's worth anything. Because that same door that opens for you, because you now have a high school diploma, will close or will send you back out that same door when they realize you have no life skills or no self-worth or you just don't care about anything, you know, kind of stuff. So that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to fill in their names throughout the school year so that that name means something. So anytime something happens in class, it's really easy to say, how's your diploma coming along? You know, how's that name? What is that? What do you do today? Sixth hour, seventh hour at the end of the day? So how'd your day go today? How was everything? How much work did you do on that diploma, your name? Uh, does it mean more today than it meant yesterday? Um, some of us take that for granted because you're at a point in your lives where you just naturally do that. You give best effort. You care. Um, it's just kind of ingrained. It's not ingrained in our kids. Very few of them. A handful, but not many. Um, those things are more important than knowing where to put punctuation in a sentence. Um, how to do a lead paragraph from a journalism class. Um, those things are so much more important. It's just laughable. Um, so it's not that we don't do those things. Guys, we have a, a, a pretty serious level of accountability at our school. We have a 70% to pass um, percentage. Uh, the kids can't have 60, 50% to pass our classes. 70%. Um, we have a very strict attendance policy. Um, kids have to get it done in our class. I teach a college prep class. The, the kids, uh, we don't have a whole lot of kids that are going to go to college. A lot of them will go to trade schools. Um, other, they'll get other education, but, it, but I'm teaching them mostly the process is to be successful in college, college kind of thing. Um, there's a very high expectation in that class. Um, they can't make up work because you can't do that in some college classes. Um, they're expected to take what we have raised the standards to at cash high and then up to here for that class. And that's just how it is. Sorry. I'm sorry that happened. But what would happen if you're at Utah State and the same thing was going on? Um, we got to find a way around this. And again, it's not about the class. It's not about that individual situation. It's about the process. So we're able to learn from the process, not the individual thing. I'm sorry. No, you can't make up that quiz we took today. I'm sorry you can't. You know the rules. Okay, that's how it is. Would that be the case in every class up here? Of course not, but it might be, so that's what we prepare ourselves for. But now let's talk about the process. So why did you stay home? Why did this? I probably didn't need to. I probably could have. No, 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 probably. There aren't any probably's we're working with here. Let's do this right. Because it's right, and you know it's right, and you're worth doing things right. So we're always working with processes. But college prep comes about halfway through the school year, so they know the teacher, they know the instruction. And more importantly, they know that everyone's on their side. They know that everyone cares. And um, I would argue kids that get into college prep want to be there because um, they've learned and they want to prove to Ron that they can do it. Like, I know to hand things in now. I want to prove I can do that, you know? And so I think it helps where that falls into our schedule. Let me just say one more thing. Vonda said as she was introducing this conference, she said... Um, we're talking about finding a way to have one hand to help through crisis. She said that in her little introduction. Um, at Cash High, we're a community of hands. Everybody helps. Different ways, different times, different situations. But we're, it's, it's all about helping. Um, it, it's about helping in um, an intake. It's about helping to, to back up what's going on in the classes. It's helping with... Um, independent study. Um, it's helping with teachers coming in and saying, hey, can I have this kid because he, this is happening or this is happening? Oh, yeah. Uh, we're just doing this little thing here. It's just not a thing. Well, you take him today. That's fine. Um, so that, to me, represents a high degree of trust that you have with your uh, teaching peers at Cash High, that you all, um, that you trust each other, that you're all working for the same team. How, but you only have a few teachers at Cash High. How can you, how do you think that can be uh, established in a much larger faculty at, uh, at a much larger high school? Since I've only taught at Cash High, one, that's true. And I will tell you what, at our school, and Sheree is, I, I was going to, the old joke, if you would like to be rich, here's your first step, start with a million dollars, and then let's go from there. 
Um, if you want a really, really, really good school situation, start with the best principal in the world. And we'll build off that. Uh, so I agree. At a small school like we have, one non-functioning, what am I trying to say? One, one thing that doesn't work right makes a big difference, makes a massive difference because there are so few of us. We've had principals that really haven't caught the vision. We've had them that don't really care or don't really want, it's the alternative school. I don't want to be here, you know, kind of thing. Um, so it starts from the, the front office and permeates everywhere. And when we have staff meetings, it's all about the kids. Sometimes we don't even cover any agenda items. Okay, here's your two-page thing. Read this on your own. Let's talk about some kids. That comes from this. And I don't, so I'm going to let her talk about that because she was a vice principal at a big school. And so she can, you know, maybe answer your question. I don't know if there's a hard, fast answer to that. But. I don't think there's a hard, fast answer to any of this. Uh, and some of this stuff that you're hearing is stuff you already know. It's just a little refresher. And I've been in your shoes where I've sat out there and thought, boy, why aren't I doing that? That's just common sense. Um, but at Mountain Crest, for example, in a big high school setting, um, the way that we try to get teacher buy-in, and, and again, you hope you have it, um, would be through PLCs and meeting with um, groups like uh, your individual PLC. So you'd go to your English PLC and your math, and you'd do your individual professional learning community. And then there would be someone selected out of that group who would meet with the principal, Bob Hinky who's like a curriculum instructional guru. He's amazing. He's retired, freaking idiot. And love, love, love the guy. He's going to be a mission president um, in some death zone in Mexico. So maybe, good luck, teach resilience there, Bob. But that's not what the talk's about. Um, no, the PLCs worked magic, Terry. And it, and, it brings, and it builds a cohesiveness because you're there as departments, you know. And you know in department meeting, it gets kind of territorial. Um, you for, it's usually nothing about kids and everything about which novel are we reading now? And um, then that one person would come into that meeting with Bob and they'd discuss it in a broader spectrum. But then just the communication, I think the good communication is really important at a larger high school because um, you've got too many people on, you know, way out wings who want to know what's going on too. And if you're an administrator and you want cohesiveness, you better get to those outside wings and make sure they feel a part of it. So, so yes, I do think it can happen there. Um, small does help us. We are increasing all the time. In fact, now we have, because um, cash high is not just the alternative. We also do, I'm the youth and care director for our district, and I'm also the adult ed coordinator in our district. And so we're doing lots of outreach things, but um, communication is what's going to build that cohesiveness and making everyone feel like they have a part in it. You know, and I think some people have a great talent with that, and it's hard. You know, it's reaching out to everyone. But um, at a big high school, that's how we worked it at Mountain Crest, and I felt like it worked really well. I was going to tell you the three things I think in 28 years, if I had to pinpoint what builds resilience, um, they would be consistency, accountability, and kindness. Um, I know they've all been talked about today, but um, at an intake at Cache High or even someone coming into Mountain Crest High School or South Cache Middle School, um, the, the tone is set from the get-go. And um, not a, at the big high schools, you wouldn't meet with the principal, but at Cache High, you meet with me, every student that's coming in. And every six weeks, we get new students who are behind in credit. And um, keep in mind that with anxiety and health, there's a whole new population of kids that miss six months in ninth grade. And so these aren't drug kids. These are just a nice girl who... I was too, you know, my anxiety was too bad. I couldn't go. Or I stayed up all night gaming and I didn't go to ninth grade. And so we're seeing a whole different population. But the first thing I do is make the parent come in and we sit down. And like sometimes the kid just wants to come in because he's 18. And I say, well, that's great. But in public school, 18 doesn't matter until you graduate. So make sure you bring your mom or someone who can, you know, represent you. And there have been a few occasions that hasn't happened. But in general, the parent comes in. And we talk about the two things that matter, you know, to me at Cash High, and it's you can't have an F. And when I say that, their eyebrows kind of go up, and I say, um, we're not going to earn an F at Cash High, so it's got to be above 70%. And the reason why you can't is because if I keep doing what they allowed you to do, we'll get the same results. So we're not going to have an F. And that means that what you're committing to today is um, that if you get below a 70% in a class, you will stay after school. And um, I'll walk around and get you, 
and you will think that I won't because that's what you're used to. In big schools, it's hard. No one tracked you down at Mountain Crest. Um, but I will literally track you like a dog. I will find you, and we will work with the teacher to bring that grade up. And you're committing to that. So before you say you want to come to Cash High, make sure that you can say that you'll do that. And when that night comes, you might tell me, Shree, I have a job. I've got to go. There is some common sense built in, but not much. The expectation is you have time in class. Make sure you don't earn an F. So usually I have the counselor there, and she's already warned them. She really cares about attendance. She's like, crazy, crazy. You've got to really focus in on attendance. And um, so the attendance thing goes the same way. It's the same discussion. Let's look at what you did, where you're coming from. So we look at your Green Canyon attendance, which often is hideous. Um, I ask them things like, tell me about, tell me about your attendance. Why, why didn't you go to school? Well, I hate it. It's dumb. My teacher's boring. My friends are funny, you know, funner. Angie's is open all day. You know, there's always a better offer. And I said, that's great. But again, before you sign up, make sure that you intend to uh, attend school because I will, again, track you down. Um, we're coming to school every day. In six week, weeks, you can miss three days, and that's all you can miss. So we kind of have this upfront accountability. So the accountability is set in stone from the get-go. And then the follow-up is a nightmare, but it's done every day. I watch attendance every hour, all day long. Now, that sounds impossible for me, and so Utah State has an AmeriCorps program. If you're at a school and you don't have a VISTA, you need to look into this program. It's called AmeriCorps. You pay for a full-time person. for It's like $6,500. It's free. Um, these people are being robbed of all their freedom for very little coin, and um, they're wonderful. And I usually, every year, get a VISTA who can help me with attendance because I don't do it just once a week, and attendance is really hard, and I don't know what to do about it. No, <laughs> even at Mountain Crest, know this, even at a big high school, attendance can be taken. And I watched attendance like a hawk. Um, well, not hour by hour there, but um, definitely at Cash High, it's hour by hour. So attendance, there are solutions. And um, there's new funding that just came out through um, the state TSSA funds. If you're from another school, <laughs> go talk to your administrator. Those can be used for an attendance helper. If attendance isn't happening at your school, it can if you're being told it can't, call me. I'll give you my cell. Everyone in the Valley has it. Um, anyway, so accountability, I think, is critical. Consistency is critical. If you're going to say you're going to do something, they're used to an administrator not doing it. And I tell them, you've kind of never met anyone like me. If I tell you this is happening, it's going to happen every single time. And then I have to be true to my word. I have to be consistent. And um, I tell them that I'm as vigilant on these issues as I am helping them out and making sure they know that we care and that they can be successful. And eventually, um, I'm not going to say that it's always successful, that it doesn't, that sometimes I'm not at your front door, ding dong. I mean, how embarrassing is that? Your principal's at the door. And um, I just say, hey, are you ready for school? Well, no. <laughs> Welcome to hell. We got to get to school. So you best get your clothes on. I'm going to sit in the car for five minutes, and then I'm going berserk, so let's go. And it happens, and sometimes it happens, you know, a couple different times at the beginning of the school year, and then your reputation precedes you, and they say, like, hey, that principal's crazy. When they come in to meet me, they'll say, yeah, I've already heard. Like I'll, like, I'll go to say something, and they're like, yeah, I've already heard. So I, and I'm okay with that. I want them to know that I love you enough that I'm going to get in my car, and I'm going to come pick you up. And the mom and I tell them that, too. If there's an issue, we're going to come get you. So those three things are critical. Kindness, I think, is always important. I know I sound very sarcastic. Well, I am very sarcastic, and um, it's weird. I, I can't tell you how I pull it off, but um, I will stand in the hall quite often and threaten to throat punch a kid. But um, they just, you know, kind of like we have these countdown clocks that tell them when they should start heading to class. And my expectation is that once that clock stops counting down, they're heading to class. And they will, you know, if they're dawdling, I'll say like, hey, you know, don't make me throat punch it because I will. And they're always like, throat punch, punch me. That'd be great. Let's see. I want you to, you know. But they go, and it's kind of a nice camaraderie. And then they go to a better person than me to get their education. Um, I think the teachers can count on if there's a problem in class, it'll be taken care of. Um, and I think as a teacher that that, I appreciated that with administrators I had. Um, anyway. Those are the three things I would tell you that are kind of the key. <laughs> okay. And they'll stay away from me. <laughs> I have been throat punched, and it's not as fun as it sounds. Oh, okay. This is, this is a little bit about accountability, too, real fast. They have to put their phone in a pouch. And a lot of high schools right now are using those um, calculator pouches. 
So you walk in the classroom and you put them on the, how many of you use those? I know they're pretty popular right now, none of you? Well, these are expensive, but they're just like a miracle worker. You walk in and you get a pouch, and the kids love them. No, they hate them. <laughs> and they put their phone in here and then it locks, and they can't undo it. But, it. but it stays with them because, you know, that phone is like attached. It's their heartbeat. And so they shut it and um, leave it on their desk. But because I'm super fun with accountability, what do I do? I come into the classroom, my big large body, and I walk around the room and I make sure that their phone's in there because kids are tricky. Mm -hmm. And I make sure it's locked. And if it's not, I take their phone for the whole day. And I do that enough that they really think, there's a good chance she's going to come in and just wreck the whole day. I might as well just lock my phone up. <laughs> and they're right, I won't. So that works. That's another little accountability thing. Wow. How does the lock work? It's magnetic. So when they walk out, they just hit this thing and it undoes it. But they're very expensive. This is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. There is some extra funding in at-risk population than I would have had at Mountain Crest. But I do believe in phone pouches. I think there's solutions for cell phones too, just because I do know that um, they're an issue and it's hard to be present and learning when you're mm -hmm. on your phone. Anyway. Okay, now let, let me make sure that you understand why some of these things happen. First of all, um, the accountability and responsibility thing are extremely important because that's real life. Everything has to relate to real life. Everything, everything, everything has to relate to real life. In fact, I'm sure my kids at some point don't want to hear that anymore. Um, cash high is very warm and fuzzy, um, is, despite the throat punches. Um, and they have to know that people aren't going to necessarily do all of that for them when they get out in the real world. So we need to make sure that those things happen. But without that caring, the the paradigm shift, the change in attitude, the I feel like I'm worth all this, I can do this for a reason now, none of that will happen without the caring thing. So Sheree comes off as pretty in your face and gruff sometimes, but I've never met anybody who cares more about her kids. And the, and the kids understand that. The new ones don't. They're all kind of deer in the headlight when they first meet her. And, um, but real soon it comes to, and if they don't understand and they say something, there's 20 kids in their face um, telling them that Sheree's your best friend. Um, no one will work harder for you or because of you than Cherie, Cherie will. So let me mention a couple things here real quick. Um, the very first time I met Cherie, she came actually to, when they named her principal, she came to our very last staff meeting um, with our old principal. And she didn't want to be involved. It was, hey, this is still your bit. Everyone involved. You know. Warning. Yeah. Oh. Well, because we are afraid of her. No, um, So she just introduced herself, she got our names, and that was it, and then we saw her next fall. And the very first thing, or one of the first things she said in our very first staff meeting as the principal at Cash High was, uh, we, as of now, have a no-F policy. Um, I've been there the entire time of Cash High, was the, as I mentioned, you know, through all the principals, all the situations, all the groups of kids, the whole bit, and I thought this lady is <laughs> nuts. I thought high, but I shouldn't say, you know, I didn't want to say that. So I went behind nuts and high, like, holy crap, holy. And I almost said something in the meeting, and I thought that probably won't be appropriate. Because, plus, I don't know her all that well yet. So I grabbed her right after the meeting, and I said, Sheree, about this no F policy. And she said, yeah. And I said, do you know where you are? And it's, it's not like I never set standards for my kids. It's not like, hey, you're a cash high. All our kids flunk, you know, kind of thing. In fact, for a long time... And I don't remember if it was Shree that started it or it was right before she came on board. Um, we had a per classroom grading scale. Each teacher could establish their own grading scale. Uh, mine worked up from 50% when I started because that's what my mentor teacher said that the big schools did, 50%, which I thought was bizarre. Like the chair can get 50%. Um, and it eventually worked all the way up to 80%. Um, my, in my class, you got an A, a B, or an F. Um, and that was how it was for several years. Now, if the kid gave full effort, did everything, turned all the assignments in, and I could tell he just wasn't capable, then I made adjustments, of course. But um, finding the kid who got 62% when it was at 60, and I raised it the next year to 70%, and that same kid magically got 72% and 62 you know, obviously, it's just, hey, teacher, set the lowest level for me, tell me what I can do to get by. 
So that's fine. If that's what you need me to do, I'm going to eventually jack it up to 80%. All right. But Cherie's point of, and this is all she had. She didn't get mad. She didn't think, wow, you've been here the whole time. You're a moron, um, which was true and is true. Um, she said, well, look at it this way. And she mentioned this. If they were allowed, not allowed, but if they flunked at Mountain Crest and we allow them to flunk here, why do we have a cash high? And um, yeah, that's a really good point. And, and it, it just goes back to the fact, why do we allow a kid to flunk at all? Why do we allow him to go through a situation and not be successful? And it was just a whole different perspective kind of thing. Not a whole different perspective, but guys, literally, we added up. We did this for our accreditation. We had our VISTA volunteer um, go check the number of Fs that we had per term. We have six terms in a year per term. And the number of Fs that we had prior to Cherie showing up, and I know she doesn't like to be you know, patted on the back and told this stuff, but they were in the hundreds. I mean, literally, a term would have, we'd have 182 Fs. Not 82 kids, you know, 182 kids, but if you flunked all six classes, there's six of your Fs. So we had that, her first year, not once did we get to double digits. Not once did we get to double digits. It worked overnight because that's how it needs to be. So is this a long, drawn-out process? It has to be worked on some things, but some things not. Um, a paradigm shift is a paradigm shift. Guys, the kids don't like these at all. They, ha or they hate these with a passion. But all we have to do is explain why. Guys, you can't have your phone out all day at work. I mean, you can't do that. What if your boss walks by? Or what if you have a project to take care of? Or what if you, see, it's all about life. It's not about, yeah, it's not about you, your phone. We want you to be present. What these teachers have prepared is really important. I want you to be able to hear it. If your phone's put away, you'll hear more. And if the kids are honest, they'll ask the ones that have done it, and they'll say, yeah, I listen better. Yeah. You know, they know it works, so it is cool. I want to add to the F thing, because you might wonder how that works a little bit. We print their grades, and then um, my visitor prints those grades off for me, and then I walk around to classes and have that F grade. And I'll whisper to, to a kid, like, individually, like, hey, I'm going to just say that. I'm not gonna, okay, and if not, I'm saying it lunch. So they might come at lunch and be like, sure, yes, I got this job opportunity, and I'm really excited about it. And I don't say stick it. I say, hey, that, you're going to get a job. You had better land that sucker. What can I do? Do you have your resume? Don't wear your shirt like that. Do this and this. And I spruce them up and I say, hey, but tomorrow night, do you think you can stay? Because here's the thing, you can't have now. Yeah, yes, and you know what? I'll stay for lunch. Okay, that would be great. So I make these little deals all the time with them, but they're accountable for that app and it works great. Sometimes if I'm busy, I'll have the teachers hand them out, but nothing's as powerful as me walking around making them accountable like, hey, you got, what are you thinking? You know? And if it's the same kid, they're kind of embarrassed. And when they don't have it, they'll be like, hey, Shree, do you know I don't have an app? I'm like, yeah, I do. That was freaking awesome. You just saved your life. You know? And they're so excited. So it starts building. One thing that Gary said that Ron and I kind of looked at each other, confidence, you need confidence. Where do you get that confidence if no one's ever believed in you? Mm -hmm. And so we start that slow process of, you rock. You have like straight Bs, and that is so freaking awesome. And they don't even believe it. They, you know, they're so happy with themselves. But closing, go ahead, and I'm gonna get hand out a phone. Okay. Um, again, everything relate everything to life. Let them know you care, and that's the two bottom lines right there. I mean, that's it. If if everything, if you can explain why you're doing everything, I, I always struggle with subjects, and I know some things you got to kind of take a a little detour route to get to to explain why you might have to use this in life at some point. Uh, and I understand that. Um, in my journalism class, unless they're going to write for a newspaper, unless it's just the communication skills, I have a harder time explaining all that. But everything has to have a reason. Guys, I'm, I'm trying to help you be a better person, or I'm trying to help you with this in life, or whatever, whatever. Um, and they know that we care. There's never a question that our kids don't know that we care. Um, Sheree's going to read something with you here in just a minute. But, but oh yeah, i got to have this because we're recording this in case any of you want to sue us. No, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. I don't have anything. I'm a school teacher. You can sue her, okay? Um, I had looked this up because this popped into my head. This is something I share with my kids time after time after time after time. Um, and then Gary actually brought this up, and I had it on my phone already to share with you. Um, this I thought this came from the movie Coach Carter. Um, there's a... a kid in the movie, Timo Cruz, who, all the kids, it's from a ghetto, it's a real life story from um, the Bay Area up around San Francisco, and um, these kids struggle. It's a ghetto area, and, and their life suck, and it's tough. 
And uh, there's one kid, Timo Cruz, who just goes through more than all of them put together kind of thing. He quits the team once. Um, he has to do a bunch of stuff to get back with the, with the program. Um, his uncle shot right in front of him. A um, bunch of stuff that goes on. And all throughout the movie, Coach Carter keeps asking him, what's your deepest fear? And the players are just like, what? what does he keep asking now? What is your deepest fear? What does that even mean? Kind of thing. And finally, at the end of the movie, and you probably have to watch this to get the whole picture. By the way, the language is a little rough, but um, the story is freaking phenomenal. And for a long time, I thought this was actually from that movie, and then I found out that it's actually from a book that was written by Marianne Williamson. Um, I haven't read the book because I want the thought to connect to Coach Carter for me. So I haven't even read the book. Um, but this is what he started to say. This is what Gary started to kind of paraphrase. Uh, and I type this out, and I give it to every kid. I cry all the way through it. So it usually takes a while to get through this. But this is what it says. And this applies to our kids <laughs> spot on. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. It's not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. It's no problem for these kids to play dumb or to play down. And our kids do that a lot. They do that a lot. That's not okay. It's not okay at all. So it's not our inadequacies, inadequacies that we're most afraid of. It's the fact that we are capable. Because if we're capable, we need to do something with that. We need to acknowledge that, respect that, act on that. And so that's what we try to do at Catch High is to make sure that these kids know they're not inadequate. They are capable of everything. And that's a big shift for these kids. And it probably is for all kids. And I apologize. That's my only connection is an alternative school. I've never taught anywhere else. So I, my guess is it's the same in any situation or anybody you're working with. Until they've made that paradigm shift, until they've accepted that, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. They're not going to learn any grammar, any journalism, any science, math, history. They're not going to because it doesn't make any difference. I just wanted to end with this poem. It's one of my favorites. It was written by a high school student in um, Indianapolis. Six humans trapped by happenstance in a bleak and bitter cold. Each one possessed a stick of wood, or so the story's told. Their dying fire in need of logs, the first man held his back. For of the faces round the fire, he noticed one was black. The next man looking across the way saw one not of his church and couldn't bring himself to give his fire his stick of birch. The third man sat in tattered clothes. He gave his coat a hitch. Why should his log be put to use to warm the idle rich? The rich man just sat back and thought of the wealth he had in store and how he to keep what he had earned from the lazy, shiftless poor. The black man's face bespoke revenge as the fire passed from his sight, for all he saw in his stick of wood was a chance to spite the white. The last man of this forlorn group did not accept for gain. Giving only to those who gave was how he played the game. Their logs held tight in death's stiff hand was proof of human sin. They didn't die from the cold without. They died from the cold within. Anyway, thanks for being in this session today. Hopefully you gained something. And um, have a great day. Thanks for caring about resilience. Thanks.